Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries, people from around the world. We often get the videos watching from Pakistan, watching from places I've never even heard of, which is a good thing, uh, but they're watching. But I want to do part two and uh, on discernment. I believe that we're living in a time and a season where sharpening our discernment is going to be mandatory because circumstances and people, uh, it's easy to be sidetracked. As a matter of fact, one of the key things the Lord was speaking to me this week, and you might want to try this, is, um, you know, we teach uh, over and over again that the real uh, walk in the spirit and an individual is to be God-focused God searched and God protected. In the flesh, if you're self-focused, get into that and you're just trying to control life. You get self-searched where you, you just get off into control, really. Control and you want to, uh, not, you want to cope. You know, cope with life, control life and then escape life. That's practicing the presence of self. That doesn't sound very good to me. So we want to practice the presence of God. And one of the first things to start with that we often overlook is that you were saved by faith. It was a gift. You didn't do anything for that. You just opened up and received the love of God. And I'm saying that even God focused, it starts with mental consent. You got to say, you know what? I'm going to pray today. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to read. All right, it starts with consent, but without yielding, it's, you, you can fall into the trap of trying. And I'm thinking there's so much going on in the world right now, so much evil and everything. There's so many different sidetracks that this would be a time to just receive the ability to focus on God as a gift. I, Father, in the name of Jesus, God focused. Not only am I going to yield to it, not only am I going to consent to it, but I'm going to receive it as a gift that you have that capacity within me to focus on you. You know, God gave me years ago, he gave me the revelation of, Dennis, I'm giving you my undivided attention for someone who is uh, uh, ignored and invisible and rejected most of my childhood. God said, I'm giving you my undivided attention. You know what I think it's time for? It's time to reciprocate. It's time to reciprocate. Let's give God our undivided attention because the first thing you're going to think of, give God my undivided attention, I can't do that. No, in the flesh you can't. But we can pray for that, can't we? We can say, I want to receive that gift of being able to focus on you and give you my undivided attention. If your thoughts are continually toward me, more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea, I want to reciprocate and say, I want your thoughts because they're higher than my thoughts. I want your ways. They're higher than my ways. So, Father, right now, I just receive by faith the gift of the ability to focus on you more effectively than ever before. And I pray this for our congregation and for our time and for the days ahead. The focusing in on God is going to become uh, more and more prevalent in our individual lives and it's going to be more and more we're going to lean toward uh, life being 90% attitude, spiritual attitude, 10% circumstances. Lead us in that direction, Lord, by the power of your spirit. 90% spiritual perception and proper spiritual attitude. And let 10% of our lives be on circumstances. Keep in mind, we're going to be a people that are going to help people that have been traumatized. We're going to help people that have been wounded emotionally. And, and you can't give something you don't have. 
And if we increase and abound and overflow in that kind of uh, 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 focus on God, we can, we can readjust and take, bring the blind and give them sight again. Let the, let the scales fall from their eyes and to see the beauty of God all around in spite of people and circumstances. So I thank you. So I, I want to do a, like a part two, do a little review for those that are watching for the first time <laughs> on learning to discern or the discernment challenge. In this day and age, discernment is the ability to discern uh, spirits. Obviously, discerning of spirits is not applicable for an unsaved individual. <laughs> it's not going to do them a bit of good. It all seemed like foolishness to them. But for those of you that have tasted the good things of the Lord, you know that the Spirit of Jesus is real, and you can touch Him, hear Him, see His manifestation. There's nothing like it. So uh, I'm just going to do a real quick review of, of what we did in the first message, and that's the definition. Discerning of spirits is the ability to discern the spirit world. Um, especially to detect the true source of circumstances or motives of people. In other words, the source of circumstances and the source of what's motivating people. You can say the right words and have a bad motivation, can't you? And so discernment is necessary in the days ahead. It's in 1 Corinthians 12. It's, uh, you know, um, included in the gifts of the Spirit in verses chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, 1 Corinthians. But the definition to discern is to, to separate, to discriminate, uh, to differentiate between the various spiritual realms of divine, evil, and human. Those are the three realms. Discernment covers the divine, the human. You, ha you have a human spirit, whether you're born again or not. You, God made you with a spirit, soul, and a body. All three. And so... You can discern the human spirit, and the best recommendation, of course, is start with yourself before you go discerning anybody else. Let the Word of God discern you, and then you're in a better shape to be discerning other people. But it, uh, discernment enables a person to identify the condition uh, of the spirit. It gives revelation of root issues, gives clarity, removes confusion, gives clear direction so you can Bring deliverance, instruction, counsel, healing, whatever is necessary at the time. The gift of discerning of spirits is one of the nine. And it allows believers to have a recognition of the identity, including the condition of the personality or spirit at play. Isn't it interesting that, that even, even demons' name manifests by their nature? They do what their name is. Hmm? We as Christians should do what our name is, huh? Deaf and dumb spirit, well, how does it manifest? Deaf and dumb, right? Spirit of fear, how does it manifest? Fear. Yeah. Yeah, all right, so they, the name matches the nature, and God wants to bring us to be able to discern and distinguish that we function and fall in love with the nature of Jesus and receive it by faith. Again, I just want to pray that prayer again. I just receive by faith, it's a gift to discern the nature of God and to uh, enjoy his economy and enter into that realm of spiritual living and thank you God that you can you can by your power of your spirit give me the gift to maintain that focus how how else can we I don't want to be trying to do it but what does it mean when it says fix your eyes on Jesus I can't just do that in the flesh I'm believing that God's given me the capacity to to have that sustained, sustained apprehension and, and possession of the presence of God and my mind being fixed on Him. Now, the, the gift of the uh, discerning of spirits, there, it is true, I've run into people uh, that are gifted more in one area than the other, but the, primarily it's the human spirit, evil spirits, or Holy Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, some people are particularly gifted in following the flow, like in a meeting or worship or what have you. Others uh, are very sensitive to uh, the source of circumstances, and they engage in intercession uh, quite effectively. 
Uh, I know Jason and I emphasize the human spirit. It's as easy to read the human spirit as to whether the source to differentiate between when the answer is a right answer and when the answer has the right source behind the right answer. Okay. So everyone needs to exercise discernment. And we talked about what false discernment is. It's important uh, to understand false discernment and distinguish between human judgment. Our discernment is often little other than judging. We're so quick to perceive, you know how they say, what's the old saying, um, um, my first impression. Okay, well, first impression can just be, be mental judgment. Sometimes, hopefully, you'll be pleasantly surprised that it wasn't that bad. Other times, it was, it's worse than, it, <laughs> than you thought it was. So discernment will differentiate between good and evil, right? Anybody made some quick judgments and found out you were dead wrong? Anybody make some quick judgments and found out, oh my goodness, I was right. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, the separating it out, it's the spirit of God, is it an angelic spirit, is it the demonic spirit or human spirit, and you know, it's by reason of use, too. You ask God questions, you, you discern, and then you tuck it away because at a later date, you find out that that information was quite beneficial. There's a difference between feeling like you're being ministered to by an angel. It's quite a bit different than, than feeling like somebody's praying for you. And it's different than discerning what's going on in an atmosphere. It's the, you know, there's distinctions, and you can learn these things. You should make it an adventure to live the Christian life. But to start with God focus, then you can be God searched and God protected. You can steep yourself in God reality, as we've said, God initiative. That means he's the source. And then God provision. The provision will always be there if he's the source. We make a lot of times often make mistakes by uh, thinking something is good, so it's got to be God. And not necessarily. We need to learn to wait on the Lord, wean our uh, likes and our dislikes and make sure then that when we make a decision we're going forward with the with the grace of God the, it's God who is at work to will and to do uh, false discernment is really just judging and we're never going to see or discern clearly if we're a judge type person uh, we need to Eliminate false discernment, and some of the key ways you eliminate so false discernment is true discernment comes from a heart that has ceased striving. There's a powerful indication right there. You want to learn to dis discern. You can't be in an adrenaline rush. You can't be overly excited and think you have discernment. You'll just go with the, the, the preference of the flesh at that moment either the likes or the dislikes. So all true discernment comes from a heart that has ceased striving, a heart that knows, uh, even in the fiery trials of personal struggle, that the Lord is God. And uh, I know uh, Jason uh, testified to it, I've done it, that in the times of, of great physical pain and illness, that you can still find God, you can still find Him, even though that could be a major distraction, you can still get into the presence of God. He's, he doesn't go anywhere. You really never really have an excuse. Sometimes it's harder than other times, sure, but there's no excuse. He doesn't leave. And, and there's that ability that I can remember even when I had that uh, severe sciatic pain for many years. Uh, it, was, it was, God, what do you want me to do? Do I quit ministry? Do I, I can't even concentrate when people are talking to me? And, and it was like when I was willing the only thing he said is, watch your attitude. And that's when I went over to Philippians. Have this attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Have this mind, it says in some translation. But have this attitude that was in Jesus. And the first thing to do is to humble yourself. And so I would just simply say, if, I, if this stays like this the rest of my life, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Isn't that funny? Then after all those years, that's when I got healed. 
gee, it's amazing what hum humility might do. We should have tried it sooner. You know, I don't know if that's the case or not. But uh, God's basically saying if true discernment has to be motivated by love. So if you see, oh, I discern sister so-and-so, and I discern brother so-and-so has this or that, uh, ask yourself, is that coming from love or is that just judging? Is it coming from a place to where you're praying for them or you're looking for a redemptive solution? What good is discernment if discernment comes from love, abounding love, real knowledge and abounding love, what good is having the right answer if you're not doing anything redemptive about it? Hmm? Think about it. Make you feel better? That's flesh. But true discernment is motivated by love. If we're going to have it, abounding love, Philippians 1.9. This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge. So that's spiritual knowledge. Real knowledge and all discernment. Love overflows into all discernment. If you're not in a love attitude, I don't trust your discernment. I don't trust my discernment. Because there has to be a redemptive. Discernment comes from love, and love is always redemptive. So see, to what degree are you willing to participate in being part of the solution? God may call you to merely pray. God may call you to, to do more than that. But true discernment is always rooted in a deep love for God and people. This frees us to discern accurately. False discernment looks at people and situations outwardly and, and pretends like it knows what their motives are. And that's not like, that's false discernment. Pretend that you think you know what their motive was. You see that person on the phone talking in the store? I think they're talking about me. That's a little bit of an ego, isn't it? That stranger over there talking on the phone, they're probably talking about me. I could tell by the way they looked at me. All that kind of stuff is demonic. And if it, you, you give in to that easily, you need to repent and simply say, where's the love? Where's the redemption in that opinion? And even if I'm right, what did I do about it? Anything loving? Did I pray for them? So, one, one, one way to eliminate that false discernment, though, if you can't pray for them with a heart of love, your perception will be corrupt <laughs> and a little bit more than natural judgment. So, we want to allow the peace of God to rule. False discernment is often driven by an underlying force that pressures us to make judgments about a person quickly. Without love and peace, discernment will always be overly harsh. That's another good way to discern. If it's overly harsh, what good is it? Even if you're right. The issues of the heart are key in affecting the accuracy of your discernment. Now, now I want to cover into some new material uh, for part two. And that is the hindrances to discernment. This is something we can really get into as a church and pursue, pursue that intimacy with God. And again, when you pursue that intimacy with God, even the very first step uh, is to be God-focused. I receive that as a gift. I don't know about you, but I need grace. I didn't get saved by trying or by works. I got saved by opening my heart and letting God Trusting God, if you are who you say you are, do it. Well, God, if you are who you say you are and you want us to focus on you, then I receive the gift to be able to focus on you better rather than try. Temporarily resist yielding, T-R-Y. <laughs> it's too much of our Christian life that does not involve the proper yielding, where nothing good comes from trying if you're not going to yield ultimately to God. And I see even the first step in my prayer outline when God was teaching me in the school of the Spirit, I could see an improvement even in that after all these years. And the first step was, then as you got to, first step is you consent. That's mental. Consent to go sit down and pray. Right? It starts with a mental decision. But sometimes you overlook that. Once you consent to go sit down and pray, you need to... Receive as a free gift that ability to touch God. Otherwise, you're going to try. I don't know. I'm not hearing nothing. I don't feel nothing. You ever go that routine? I'm not getting nothing. 
Well, maybe you're not getting nothing because you're trying and not trusting. We make it harder than it has to be. So right at the very first step, once you give your consent that you're going to get alone with God in prayer, then receive the free gift that of his availability is there. And he will let you focus on him. He wants to. You think he would say, I'm giving you my undivided attention, son or daughter. I'm giving you my undivided attention. My thoughts toward you are more numerous than the grains and the sands of the sea, but I don't want you to reciprocate. That'd be ridiculous. We love because he first loved us. So we can't, we can't give him back anything that we haven't received from him. It's got to be fruit and the purpose of that. So anyway, discernment and discerning the spirits, much spiritual perception may indeed be accurate, but not necessarily redemptive. That's the one little nugget to tuck away. Perceiving and knowing something in and of itself uh, serves no constructive purpose. We do not make a distinction a lot of times between discernment and discerning of spirits because one can be flashes of insight as a gift, but the discernment, there's daily discernment that we're supposed to walk in. When you say walk in the spirit, that's not do it once and then everything will just work out. You walk in the spirit is a moment by moment relationship. Uh, the way the Lord taught me when I wanted to reciprocate uh, and I didn't know how to reciprocate. He says, Dennis, make, and I will teach you to make prayer special time and all the time. That's different. But even, do you notice Jesus didn't do anything except what he saw the Father doing while he was walking? But then he had special time where he got away. There was no disconnect. It was just different. Special time and all the time. All of it was God time and, and learning that. So, uh, we don't make a distinction uh, necessarily because we want to teach people to walk in the Spirit. If you get flashes of insight, that's wonderful. But in the reality, the moment-by-moment -moment relationship is what God really wants us to discern, to, to differentiate Spirit from flesh. That's, and, and the way you start is you let the Word of God discern you. And you're reading in, in, in the Word, no matter what you're reading, content or small verses or huge portions, you're letting it read you. And as it reads you, you respond accordingly. And things stand out. Well, if it stands out, don't treat it lightly. Treat it as something precious and cherish it. It's not standing out just because it tickled your intellect. It's standing out because God is trying to get gain your attention to have a relationship. So uh, we're supposed to uh, walk in the Spirit, grow and develop closer to the Lord through that, what we would call sanctification and consecration, but we're to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. So here's some principles. I'm just going to run through these quickly. There's, there's no accuracy without the Word of God. The Word discerns. If you don't use what you have, you use milk. It doesn't say desire the milk of the Word that you might grow. Oh, so there's an assumption there that the milk of the word is good, but you will grow thereby. Because what? Because strong meat belongs to them who are full age, who by reason of use. You don't use it. That's one of the major hindrances. Spiritual relationship is proportional to the level of your submission to God. Direction comes from the spirit, not your soul or your body. I've, I've watched too many people shipwreck on, oh, I, oh, I heard God say, uh, and I've got these voices that told me to go do this, and, and you can feel in the atmosphere that what's behind it is ungodly. You've got to learn to distinguish between the nature and the character of God behind a, even a corrective word. I've seen people go into condemnation unnecessarily. It wasn't God speaking to them. It wasn't God. Sure, they may have blown it, but rather than receive forgiveness and let that blood cleanse you and walk in relationship with one another and with God, they chose to just live under the condemnation of it. Direction comes from the spirit, not the soul. Spiritual strength is proportional to your a level of submission to God. Spiritual relationship should be developed. God wants a habitation. He wants a place where he can abide in us individually and corporately. Um, 
most supernatural, and we had you repeat this in the first message, if you would grab hold of this truth, you would advance in the kingdom of God, in your relationship with God. Most spiritual reality is too quiet for your flesh. What does that tell you? You're probably missing a whole lot of supernatural because you don't know how to sit still. I've watched the people that progressed, but some people progressed rapidly in learning how to be God's search, deal with their issues, and made rapid improvement, but they kind of petered out a little bit when it came to spending time with God and enjoying Him. If you can't spend time enjoying Him, you haven't quite learned to wean the distractions of the mind, the will, and the emotions that wants to be something, do something, to-do lists, rather than be with God. It's almost like there's a fear comes in that being with God, I'm wasting time. What was it, John Wesley? They said, I'm going to pray an extra hour. I've got so much to do today. That, that concept does not register with the average Christian. But he was dead serious. He knew, he knew that that relationship could be easily torn in many different directions because of the many projects, the many sidetracks. But we're, gonna, we're not going that way, I'll tell you. God wants to, uh, spirit, soul, and body. You know, the soul, mind, will, and emotions, even for a Christian, and I've watched them burn out, I've watched leaders burn out, it wants hype. It learns by excitement, lust, adrenaline, stress, suspicion, fear. That's not the sermon. That's the soul. And the soul actually gets engaged in a lot of that stuff. Think about it. What does the soul do? It likes hype. I've seen it in religious circles. People who really don't walk with the Lord, don't have a prayer life, don't have anything, but boy, they like everything that's excitable and hype and demonstrative. I, so I've told that story a million times, but I'll never forget this person that they looked up to as an intercessor. She was actually actually controlling the pastor and everything. And, and she was interceding, interceding and weeping and crying and threw herself on the floor. And she said, there, we got the breakthrough. And I could discern the whole time, you are in the flesh and you're exhausted from all of the emotional gyrations. That is not breakthrough. That's exhaustion. And if you don't know the difference, you've got no business controlling that pastor with your revelations. Dangerous. There was a period in time in the New England area where we experienced a lot of that, where the intercessors were running the church. Intercessors don't run the church. Pastor is in charge. I, I, we've heard stories of, a, of intercessors came up with the idea that there were dead Indian bones on the property buried and that until we dig them up and get rid of that, we're, the church is never going to prosper. And he bought into it and got a big road grader and dug up the property looking for bones. Huh? Never found a thing. But it's so sad that you can be, you can be overly gullible. I'm, I'm all for spiritual revelation and things that are strange and bizarre, but let the strange and bizarre be revealed by Jesus, not by strange and bizarre people. <laughs> Can you discern the difference? <laughs> it's, it's really the key. I've got too many years under my belt watching people use that word discern. I'll tell you what, you just fall in love with Jesus and your discernment will be proper. You love God and love people and not, want, not use your discernment for a platform or uh, a status symbol that look at me, I know. That and a hundred dollars might get you groceries. You know, <laughs> but God's looking for principles that most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. Please, please, take that extra time in prayer and not say, I've got so much to do. And just say, God, I'm just going to stay here a moment longer to honor you. And see if all of a sudden that flesh doesn't have the, the striving and the neediness. You, what we use in our prayer courses, weaning your flesh like a weaned child with its mother. I have quieted my soul within me. It's good enough for Dave. It's good enough for you. Right? 
So, all right. Now, let me, these hindrances to discernment can be, uh, oh man, I got a million of them here. I did this for someone who was going to, taking a course in Bible school, and he says, you, you, you know stuff about the sermon. What, about, what are some of the hindrances to it? And I wrote this list of 18 in probably five minutes. Low fellowship with the Father. You know, no, not much of a prayer life. Not much of a word level. Pride. Unforgiveness destroys discernment. Prejudice imitates a bad witness. If you've got a prejudice and somebody does something like speak in tongues, but you don't speak in tongues, and it goes, <clears throat> that's not a bad witness of the Holy Spirit. That's your prejudice speaking. And it can appear as discernment. Lust <laughs> counterfeits as a good witness. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like God wants me to get that. Yep, 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 yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's got to be God because I want it so bad. These are all clear hindrances to discernment. You really want to discern, you're going to have to be honest with yourself when these things exist. Practicing the presence of self, your whole life revolves around what you do for you. How about what you do for God? Judging and condemning people. The reason we have Tuesday nights, because a lot of hindrances to discernment is a lack of use. There's people that would be good at healing but wouldn't come to a Tuesday because you sit still. I ain't got time for that. That would wean your flesh. It might be by reason of use have their senses exercised to see, hear, and touch. See, hear, and touch. You can do it at home. You don't have to come to a Tuesday night. But still, you need to apply it in your life one way or another. See, hear, touch. Well, how are you going to see in the Spirit, touch in the Spirit, hear in the Spirit, if you don't wean your noisy flesh from all of its opinions? <laughs> Lack of peace is a hindrance to discernment. A soulish or a faulty value system, like tongues is of the devil, you will never discern it that it's of God. The real way to do is you go, wow, that's different. I never heard that before. God, is that you? Wisdom searches out the matter. That's the proper way to respond to something you don't know or understand, rather than sit in judgment on it. The other thing that I really could get concerned, even for the mature saints, even in our midst, um, there ha we have to get better at not owning something negative in the atmosphere. Discern, it means I can make the distinction it's there, but just because it's there, it doesn't have to come in. That's my fault. The old time preachers were right when they said, a bird flies over your head, it's not your fault, but if it makes a nest in your hair, yep, you did it. You gave it that permission. And so what God's saying is that, that uh, you pick up something negative and own it, instead of noticing it, would probably be the easiest way to say it. Noticing it, discernment will notice a lot of things, but then even after you notice it, you're supposed to think, what redemptively can I do? Maybe I should just pray. Always at least pray. That would keep you so positive in life that you would become, just by an expression, you would become an exemplary Christian. People would notice that. Someone that's slow to, quick to hear, slow to judge, slow to wrath. Now, uh, the non-redemptive response, remember, your discernment could be accurate and you could have a non-redemptive response to it. That doesn't glorify God. 
So you are right. You're so right, you're wrong. <laughs> self-focus, self-analysis, self-preservation, self-justice. All you want to do is cope with life, control life, and escape life. That pretty makes you the idol of yourself. Now, there's uh, five areas to discern. That this, I want you to take some notes on. There's five areas to discern. The first, the first of the five areas is discern prophecies. Ezekiel 14.4 is important to remember. Anyone who comes to the prophet with an idol in their heart, I, the Lord, will answer according to the idol in the heart. You will, you will hear what you want to hear, even though it will be false. You want something too bad to where you can't relinquish it, and then you get a prophetic word. A prophetic word is going to be a false word because of your own interpretation. And I can still remember how important it was for timing because it can be tricky. Like I said, uh, I knew from the time I got saved that I was called to plant churches. Not get hired by a church, plant churches, much harder. Because there's, you start with nothing. You're going to have to believe God to be the source of provision. Somebody's got to pay the rent. Somebody's got to pay the utilities. Somebody got, that doesn't come easily when you have nobody. <laughs> Duh. So God said you plant churches, but then I had a little office. Well, God hadn't released me to that point in the first year. <laughs> I was doing other stuff, but had a little office Bible study. And everybody goes, and this is tricky. This might happen to you, so watch out for it. They said, you should start a church. You, I would come to your church if you started a church. This is a little Bible study of eight people, Christians in the, in the marketplace, in the, in the office. And I already knew that I was called to do that. Now you've got people telling me to do that. And I fell for it. Went to a prayer meeting in Hubbard, Ohio, held hands like this, and got a little rented a little room. Everybody chipped in. I know people that like everything in Christianity to be free, but guess what? There's nothing free. I tried to tell our landlord, "Why do I pay rent? I'm a Christian. It should be free," and he's not, he not buying it. But anyway, long story short, I've held in hands. I had a legitimate calling of God to start a church. And we held hands and God spoke in what was the closest thing to an audible voice. Dennis, I'm not in this. <laughs> Boy, you want to feel like a creep? But did you see how it happened? There was a legitimate call to do that, but there was voices telling me to do it. But it wasn't God initiated. It was man initiated. And man can initiate things that sound really good. And it would have been a wonderful Ishmael <laughs> if, if, I, if I would have continued. <laughs> the beauty of it was when I relinquished it and said, God's not in it, I don't want it. And I'm going to serve uh, my spiritual father. I'm going to serve him. And support him. And I'm not doing nothing. God would have to rip me away from that service. And you know how he did? He, did. he took three prominent Christian leaders. Invite me out to lunch to say, Dennis, it's time to start your church. Isn't that a lot better? And then I knew it was real. But even then I was a battle because I'm going, well, I've submitted to my spiritual father, and I've got to get a release from God to know that it's time, because I've done this before wrong. <laughs> Duh. You know, it's one thing about doing something wrong. It does stick in your memory. You don't want to do that again. Right? That was pretty horrific. Standing, I'm not in this. Oh, God just told us he's not in this. Bye, people. Thanks for chipping in for the rent in the room. And all that, but, you know. 
It cures you. <laughs> so God basically saying, the one area is to discern whether something's from God or not, even prophecies. All right, tuck them away. Because you can, you can inadvertently take a prophetic word that is legitimate and apply it wrongly. Let God work out the details. We call it God initiative, not you try to make it happen. I've seen so many people hurt and wounded who had legitimate words from God, but they tried to make it happen. And, and, and you learn the same way I did. That's the hard way. Now, one of the areas besides uh, prophecies, discerning between right and wrong, everybody may prophesy, but let them... Let these others discern. That's a, that's a safety measure. And if you can't submit your prophetic word to someone with some season and maturity, then you probably want what you want. And that's a bad sign. You're afraid they'll tell you otherwise. In reality, you should be so neutral that you're not afraid that to be wrong. I might be right, I might be wrong, but I'm holding this open to the heart of God. I want the will of God more than anything. That's neutral. And the spirit doesn't rule the prophet. Uh, when I was uh, about two years old in the Lord, I was part of a church plant. Uh, and there was this guy, uh, their system was to if you have a prophetic word, go talk to so-and-so, you know. Well, he went and talked to one of the elders. And had the prof he had the prophetic word, and that prophetic word, and he was shaking like this. And the guy said, no, not now. He's in the middle of his sermon. Spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And he was convinced that if I don't give it, if I don't give this prophetic word, it will destroy the whole church. And so they didn't know what to do with him, so they got good old Dennis. Dennis... Could you handle this guy here? Because the sermon was over, there was a prayer, and people were leaving. And he's still going, <laughs> I'm just going to give the word, or everything's going to fall apart if I don't give the word. And I'm looking around, there, there's not even anybody here to hear your word. And I says, the, the wisdom of God is, first of all, pure and peaceable. I don't see any of that coming from you. And then even the, all the pastors went, hmm. Good point. So you need to be open to that kind of correction. He wasn't. Well, then you're just doomed. I'm out of here. <laughs> Sometimes that's a blessing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know we, we pray redemption, but you know, you can't redeem everybody. There's some people that know more than everybody. All right. Uh, so the first thing is you discern prophetic words, you discern prophecy. The second area is you discern the spirits. Remember, there's three realms, and God's giving that as a gift to discern spirits. The Spirit expressly says in the latter days, in 1 Timothy 4.1, that some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. For me, that would be proof evidence that forsake not the assembling of yourself as some do. Most of the wackiest people were people who didn't need to assemble. You know, they, were, they used to call them in our day, it was the, in the 70s, it was the surfboard Christians. Um, I'm me and my surfboard and me and God. I don't need people. You know, those relationships are more than <laughs> what they're cracked up to be. <laughs> You know, they came up with all kinds of excuses how being alone with God, they were better off. Probably other people were better off <laughs> until you learn to get some, some character. But anyway, neither here nor there. It, the, so the second area, you have to discern the spirit, whether it's um, uh, uh, human, evil, or holy. Those are the three realms. And... and You should test the spirit. First John 4, 3 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, 
but test the spirits whether they are of God or not. Because many false prophets have gone out in the world, and by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit confesses Jesus has come in the flesh, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus come in the flesh is of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already among you. To test the spirit, you would do it by the next element, test it by the word. For heaven's sakes, if it's not scriptural, you, you've got an answer right there, don't you? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction. So we have to discern prophecies. We need to discern the spirits. Was it human, evil, holy? And that's by reason of use. If you have your human spirit exercise to discern, to see, hear, and touch in the spirit realm, you strengthen it. Strong meat belongs to them in full age. Daily discernment is for those who want to grow in grace and knowledge and want to mature in God for strong meat. I believe people in this, in this church could handle strong meat, and that's a good thing. Milk needs to be desired when you're a baby and it's everything is brand new and that's okay to be a baby the question is is if you'll humble yourself and admit it and want more and be willing to sit still long enough to wean your flesh from all of its anxieties stresses and impulses adrenaline rushes is not there's so many good works that are not god find out what god's got you can't do everything So that third element is tested by the Word, because all Scripture is given. The fourth element is tested by the Spirit. Uh, you know, one of the ways the Lord taught me, we always talk about that person that had, uh, a pastor sent me people with, that had sexual issues, a woman in particular, and uh, she didn't want to deal with it. She felt like her sexual issues were very attractive to her husband, who was not saved, so... I don't want to be ministered to. And that's scary. And then uh, they sent me a guy who every woman in the church was getting the creeps when he would come around them. I could be just judging, but I think the multitude of consensus was they're not making this up. They're not imagining it. There's too, there's too much of a consensus. Um, and he came and he says, I don't care. I like being attractive, and he wasn't, but <laughs> he felt he was. I went to a Christian dinner, 400 people, and these people were from two completely different areas. I'm standing by the door watching people come in, and here comes the guy that I counseled, here comes the woman that I counseled, and they were total strangers, and they went, <laughs> boy. That made the hair stand up on the back of my neck going, whoa, talk about seducing spirits. Wow. Who do you think put those two together? It was a Christian function. It must have been God. Why would they even go to a Christian function? I don't know. Interesting. They didn't want help. They liked the way they were. I hear that even in this day and age when you're trying to help people. That's just the way I am. Well, you'll never get any better than anyway because you're too satisfied with just the way I am. If the way I am is not godly, I wouldn't be proud of it. So you test it by the word. You test it by the spirit. And then if, if Christians would even just do this, test it by the fruit. What if what you heard in your head, you did it? Say, so before you make a decision, what if what you heard in your head, you did it? What would the fruit look like? <laughs> it might scare you back to getting closer to God. <laughs> what would the fruit look like if I got what? Oh, what did it look like? Would it be carnal? Would it, be, would it glorify God or me? Who'd be the happiest there? Me or God? Yeah. But God's 
saying when you test it by the fruit, the sermon is going to teach us how to know who's got the initiative, what the source is, what's starting it, what's motivating it, what's prompting it, what that witness is. You can use all these different words, but it's ultimately the source. The sermon is to detect the source. Now, the fifth area is the mind, will, and the emotions and how they relate to discernment. You know, we're a mind, will, and emotion people. We want all three to be in submission to the Lordship of Jesus. But here's an easy little chart for you to do. Put this down in your prayer journal. The mind should be ruled by the revelation of the Word. Your revelation of the Word of God should rule over your thoughts. Your thoughts are to be submitted. That's how you wean your flesh. Your conscience, that's the voice of your spirit. Your conscience, not in your head, conscience. Conscience is in the gut. Conscience should rule over your will. Now, the conscience is only as reliable as your word level. Remember, we said, what are the hindrances to discernment? Low word level. But nonetheless, let your conscience be ruled by the will of God and let the conscience and the will of God be ruled by a proper, deep, biblical value system. And lastly, let communion rule over the emotions. What do I mean by communion? I'm talking about presencing God, touching God. Mine is what the Word of God says. My conscience is clear, Paul says. I don't even judge myself. But God wants a pure heart, clean conscience. He wants you to have that awareness that, that on the inside you're clean. And then you walk in the light as he is in light, and that blood continually cleanses. Boy, you know, we make it so hard when all you can do is simply say, God, help me to be focused on you. You think he's going to make that hard? It's a gift. Take it as a gift, not just as something you've got to try to do. You didn't get saved by trying. So if you want to give attention to God, then I'm saying I, I yield to that wonderful gift of the ability to be in touch with you, spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. That ability has been given to me. That's the, the fifth area, the mind, will, and the emotion. No. Just some simple principles, how to develop your discernment. you got to start with the Word of God by letting the Word discern you. Don't start with trying to discern people and circumstances, because a lot of it will be just judgment. Start with letting the Word discern you. Get so familiar with the Word discerning you that you can feel His nature when He corrects you. You can feel love correcting you, not condemnation. That's really important. Let the word discern you, not condemnation, but let him correct you. But even in the correction, you should be able to sense the love of God, the love of the Father. I mean, come on, if you could, if you could read a Hallmark card and get all gooey, how much more that God loves you, even in a corrective word. To go deeper in discernment, you must use what you've got. That's daily discernment. You've got to desire the milk of the word. By reason of use, have your senses exercised. That's how you move from milk to meat. You've got to practice. To go deeper, you've got to use what you've got. Milk is for those who have not developed their discernment. And direction Direction for discernment comes from the spirit, not your soul or your body. Your spiritual strength is equal to how you feed on the Word of God and drink and feed and exercise. You co-labor.
And here's a statement. We've only said it five times. Most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. What does that tell you? You think you need a little more quiet time? Especially in the hustle and bustle of the to-do list? Who, who wins in your thought life? The to-do list in the morning? Or, oh, this is another day to love God. And he's given me that capacity, whoa, to just fix my eyes on Jesus. I just receive that as a wonderful gift that we have a relationship today. Mm -mm -mm, me and him. Another day to love God. Mm -mm -mm. Now, I'm going to... Uh, I think I'm going to save that. I'm going to close with the fact that the soul wants hype excitement and it learns to judge spiritual things by becoming anxious and suspicious. If you think you've got discernment and it's been nothing more than a suspicious spirit and that's why you you judge ministries, you judge people, you judge everything, and you think you know, then right now, I believe God's giving you a chance to repent. If you're watching this and you feel like you're so discerning, then you wouldn't be afraid of this prayer, would you? I receive uh, cleansing, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that if my discernment is really just judging, I'm asking to cleanse my heart, renew me, my heart, Renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. That if my, my, all my spiritual perception that I put on Facebook about everybody, everybody else, you know, I'm kind of an expert and I just put my opinions out there on everything. Yeah, if that is not discernment and that is just judgment, I receive cleansing right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. And... I release myself to the discernment and the knowledge of God as he reveals to me, not by hype, excitement, but by cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Now, nobody should be afraid of that prayer, should they? I want to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in my perceptions in the days ahead. There's a lot happening in the world of flesh and the devil, but I'll tell you what, in all of these things taking place, I want to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and act accordingly. That would be, even when I discern evil, I'm going to look for a redemptive solution on my part, my responsibility. And I am not afraid to have my discernment judged by God. God, judge my discernment. If it's mere judgmentalism, I'm asking to be cleansed. Show me. He'll show you. That is just the opinion of man, pride of opinion. I'm receiving forgiveness right now in Jesus' name. That I might live for you and serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.